Welcome back to today's episode where we discuss the latest installments of a different series every show based on the novels by Rick Riordan. Percy Jackson and the Olympians is an action-adventure fantasy television series created by Disney+. Plus. It premiered on the 19th of this month, despite saying that it was going to premiere on the 20th. The new adaptation begins as 12-year-old Percy is accused of stealing Zeus's lightning bolt, prompting an epic adventure of him and his friends. Uh, it's December 23rd. Happy holidays to everyone. Let's begin. Two thousand five was actually a huge year for young adult novels. You had The Lightning Thief, of course, in July. Yep. You also had Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince in July. Half Blood, get it? Because of this show, mm -hmm. uh, Artemis Fowl and the Opal Deception. Uh, that which was just the, the Artemis one? Fowl. Yes, uh, April, and then first of the Twilight Saga that came out in October. Lemony Snicket's Penultimate Peril, the book before the last, came out in October of that year, and then Eldis from the Aragon uh, series oh. from the Inheritance Cycle came out in August as well. So those are huge um, enterprises that just all came out with their own book in 2005. And I found it really interesting that the first Percy Jackson just happened to be part of that entire other squad and still managed to separate itself enough for kids to start jumping aboard. But you're saying that it wasn't until the movies that you really became aware of it. Yeah, I, went, I remember I went to the theater with my uncle to see it, and then a ton of people ended up going to the movies. I think that the first one was a hit, right? Well, the first one was a box office, more of a box office success than the second one was. But as far as critical reception, it was definitely not a hit. What did you think of the first one? When I saw it the first time, and I even saw it yesterday, and by saw it, I mean I skipped through. I think that if you don't know anything about the books, it's a fine movie. Like I'd even probably give it a tomato on Rotten Tomatoes. But if you know stuff about the movie it books, if you're comparing it to the books, it is terrible. <laughs> as a nine to 12 year old at the time that it came out. I thought it was fine. You I thought would, it was fine. Yeah. Did you have any big problems with, did you ever see the second one? Uh, no, I saw the first 20 minutes a couple days ago. Okay. And so as far as what you think the biggest problems could have been if you were the, like say author. I, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's the first one you pointed out when you saw the trailer to me was that you saw that their ages were that they yes, were better the ages cast. were actually 12 reardon's biggest issue he had the aging of a 17 year old being cast for what he wanted to see as a 12 year old so that as the books went along that they, they would grow with that alexandra daddario's character annabelle <laughs> was in her she like 18 she was in her time? 20s i <laughs> believe at the early 20s when the when the movies were coming out he also wanted to point out to the producers reardon did that the 9 to 12 uh readership was the one that he wanted to appeal to the most, not the late teen audience, because the late teen audience already had movies that they could go towards, and he thought that this could be more of a family movie than uh, casting Lerman and having that kind of older, teeny angsty story. And it was, only made, story. it was only made more clear how old the cast was in 2013 when Sea of Monsters came out, because it took three years, and that was a lot different than young adult uh, fantasy films back then. Harry Potter, Marvel, The Hunger Games, and Divergent, those series either were coming out with a film or or films yearly mm. and here it, i was a fifth grader when the lightning thief came out i was going into my freshman year of high school when sea of monsters came out so it almost seemed like it was too late well i, I don't want to jump on the because i have seen things i remember when i was in high school and the harry potter movies were still coming out and i was like aren't these actors getting way too old to be playing these characters and they really weren't it was just that like when you're that age you are very specific like you're very targeted to wanting the character to be presented at that age. Yep. Does that make sense? I think that's what Reardon was getting at. He also didn't like what they did to Luke's character. He also didn't like the Persephone storyline that they threw into the movies. He also felt like there was a big missing fight with a villain that we can't even get into because that's not in the first few episodes. But when you heard about this TV show coming out and you then proceeded to watch the first two episodes, I accidentally vaporized my algebra teacher. Which is the first, which is the name of the first chapter of the book. And it, is it? I tried to look that up and I couldn't find out. Uh, and then I become Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. Room. That's the second episode, right? Having watched those now, do you feel that this is a better representation to the novels than what you got originally? Yes, as far as faithful adaptations go, this is the most faithful I think I've seen any young adult novel probably ever. And it, it makes it so obvious that Rick Reardon has to have his hands in this. I Obviously, know with the he film, pitched it, he created yeah. it, he wrote the first few episodes. The first, uh, the narration that we hear at the very beginning, which is the first scene from Percy Jackson, is ripped straight from the first page of the book. I okay. remember I reread the first couple chapters right before I watched 
watched the episode, and then when I heard it, I was like, this sounds oddly familiar. And Does I Walker Scoville voice the narration as yes, well? Yes, and I was glad that they were able to get him as Percy Jackson because they were able to get someone who has proved that they can act. So you recognized him from the Adam Project? Yes, from the Adam Project. Really? Right. Okay, did you recognize anybody else? Any of the other kids? Uh, the only none other, of the kids. The only other kid that I thought that you might be able to was uh, Leia Savas Jeffries, who plays um, Annabelle, and uh, she, Annabeth, sorry, uh, and she is from the Beast movie with Idris Elba. She played one of the daughters in that. Oh, wow. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Would have never guessed. Yeah, the only that... other person I recognized was in the second episode, Jason Manzoukas. You didn't recognize Mr. the teacher? D. The no. teacher from the first episode, that was Meg Megan Mullally um, from Children's Hospital, from Will and Grace. Uh, and it it's funny because she plays the pre-algebra teacher. And um, he, uh, Rick Reardon, was a middle school teacher at the time that he was starting to that write the book. That explains so much because around the time of middle school is when you're really learning about Greek mythology. And it's just there's so many references in the book. But to think that you would start off your book so early taking your own job position and having you attack a kid. <laughs> Seems a little like maybe he was projecting his own anger towards some of the kids that were out there. But at the same time, he based the uh, the Percy Jackson off his own child because, oh, yeah, because okay. he had dyslexia and then also ADHD. The museum sequence is 95 percent like it is in the book right before the attack. The characters are the correct ages. Percy doesn't live at home, but instead at Yancey Academy because Yancey Academy has is a boarding school. Yeah. OK. And Gabe's mom's BF. And there's something about Yancey Academy that uh, I heard that later on they didn't really talk about in the series here is that it is already for troubled kids. So he must have already done some <laughs> stuff that in, in messed the book. him up. In, in the, the book, book he, it's his sixth school that he's been to. Why? Do they explain that at because all? Because he's a lot more snarky. Logan Lerman played Percy Jackson like he was kind of this wholesome kid. But in the series, yes. Percy Jackson is, he's hes very sarcastic. Well, and he, he gets from New fights. York. So he should have that accent. Maybe they should have given him like a Brooklyn accent and he could have just been like uh, that guy from the Newsies. <laughs> I well, forget Grover, what his name was. Yeah. Grover, he is supposed to be kind of uh, a weakling. He's and, like so his, it, and Percy Jackson is supposed to kind of fight for him. It's his best friend though yes right? and he's is he like a jiminy cricket conscience type uh person yeah actually that, that, that's really not a bad way to describe and him is he all. the same way in the books as he is in the series because i've heard differing opinions on that hmm that's actually that's interesting i would say he's mostly the same but we okay. don't get a lot of grover and that was actually going in my cons a little bit that much of grover or annabelle in the first two episodes it's really annabeth. focused on percy yeah annabeth yeah okay um i mean annabeth is only introduced in the second episode but overall the story is supposed to be about percy jackson being framed for the theft of zeus's almighty thunderbolt percy must clear his name all while harnessing the powers he inherited from his father poseidon at the camp that created the dem demigods um or sorry that that house is a uh, demigod that I is not revealed until the end of the second uh, episode understood that his dad was poseidon what the oh what, even zeus's master bolt being stolen why percy needs to go on that adventure with grover annabeth doesn't even uh isn't even on that quest yet well take me through that journey but before you do i just wanted to ask so i said earlier that you would have only recognized the pre-algebra teacher but looking at this there are a couple other people that you might have been able to the mom's character sally yes Jackson. i did yeah, yeah, yeah but i didn't know from where big little little lies she was in the first season of that and then she was also a character in Nosferatu so I think I would have recognized her but Gabe more importantly the stepfather who they toned down how bad he was in the books for this uh show uh I guess he was more abusive in the in the books but he is still a loser he's played by my very favorite character from Till Death the Doug <laughs> the guy who realized who realizes, he was in a TV but show? that guy is the same guy from Undeclared who was one of the roommates not uh, Charlie, whatever his face is, the one who he is Sons of he Anarchy looks, and stuff, he, You should see a picture of him because he looks so different. He's than supposed those to look who. sort of haggard and, and disgusting and stuff. Like even in the virtual comics or whatever, the visual comics that they did for this, uh, he was supposed to be like this fat slob of a guy. But like the reason why they eat blue food is kind of a joke on him, right? Like the whole idea was that he, this is all stuff I've learned over the last couple of days because I never read the books, but apparently he was abusing the mom in a way where he said, people never eat blue food. And so it's an inside joke between her and her son that they always try to eat like blue stuff, right. like blue jelly beans. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the first episode, it's uh, Percy Jackson, a troubled student at Yancey Academy, discovers his demigod abilities and is given a magic pen, Riptide, which they never refer to it as Riptide, but it's a pen that if you use it, will can turn straight into a sword. Sounds like the Doctor Who like special uh, screwdriver or whatever. Yeah, and I was so glad to see Riptide actually portrayed in a Why? good way. Yeah. Because it's his, it's his main weapon he uses. It's almost like when uh, Harry Potter it's gets his wand. His wand. Yeah. yeah. And so after his teacher missed Dawes transforms into a monster. Uh, he uses Riptide, and I was a little bit disappointed with the Miss Dots fight, only because even in the movie, and I think it's the only thing that the movie did better than the book, okay. it's actually portrayed as an action scene. Here, it's uh, because what happens in the book is Percy, there's this girl that is bullying Grover, and he uses his powers. He's about to push her into the river, but he actually doesn't push her. It's just his Poseidon like abilities. Uh-huh. And then the Miss Dots takes him into the museum, and there's this full fight that happens but in the tv show it was just uh out in the open suddenly miss dots turns into a dragon creature and then just kind of falls on his sword and it was only like 10 seconds so they condensed it a lot one of the things so like christopher columbus gets a ton of flack about how he portrayed percy jackson in the first two films especially with how uh they tried to stay so similar to the harry potter books because this series has always been connected to harry potter because of the similar ages the schools the friend sets the prophecies but one thing i can't really blame the director for making if he had any control over casting lerman right. as an older percy jackson is the fact that between harry potter and percy jackson percy jackson does a lot more stunts a lot more fighting like with his hands and turn and jumping and leaping and <laughs> stuff well harry potter it, it is again a lot of casting magic yeah. so the special effects can go into that so like if you want to cast a 12 year old to do some crazy stunts that's going to take a lot more work and uh especially as a director to put someone through that than it would be to say hey age them up and then have them go through the um, gladiator camp or whatever that they need to do so i don't really blame them as much if that was the ultimate reason why they wanted to. Now, I have a sneaky suspicion it wasn't, just based on what everybody else has talked about and how they wanted to just appeal to a different base. But uh, that alone, it, it does make it sound like they they toned down the violence for this part of the episode. Later on, when they get to a Minotaur scene, that's what people have really talked about. But am I jumping ahead too much? Uh, yes, but I can get there pretty quickly. Okay. So after Miss Dodds uh, ends up dying, it seems that no one knows who Miss Dodds is. Everyone is just like, what are you talking they about, They blank Percy? on the pre- algebra teacher yes disappears even yeah. even the uh even the main teacher that was there the one that ends up being a centaur later on mr bruner is like there's no teacher that's ever been called miss dodge you're crazy mm-hmm. but because of what percy did to oh, the mr bully, bruner is chiron yeah yeah yes. okay. uh what percy did to the bully he ends up being expelled from school he goes to his mom the mom says that they're going to take a trip because she feels like they need to get away from gabe and she really needs to talk to him about this very important thing Grover seems to be acting a little strange and this was something I liked a lot more because the book or sorry the film expedited so much it doesn't happen where so the pacing's Grover, better it's just yes. like boom 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 it doesn't points. happen where Grover goes to the apartment that Percy Jackson was staying at and reveals he's a uh, he's a satyr there or he's half goat there yeah it is where his mom takes him to a different cabin and then his mom is trying to explain to him that uh, that Gabe isn't his father which he already knew and trying to tell him that He's is it too much of an exposition drop to have the mom just kind of give away plot details? No, like that, no, no, no. I thought that the pacing, uh, as you say, it really worked good for the first episode. But is that because you've been so aware of the source material? I'm not going to act like it wasn't. So like <laughs> any kid who's was. watching this who hasn't read the books, would they feel as if they were either bored or that the things were coming at them too fast? Like any of that? I don't think so because it, it's done in such a way where it just feels like you're, you're kind of thrown into this world, but you're enjoying and kind of embracing it sure. and so grover he explains that he's half goat and they have to make it to camp half blood and the minotaur scene that you're talking about was probably my favorite fight scene at the very end of the first episode because that minotaur was a lot scarier than he was in the movie that's what this, everybody says this yeah. yeah i don't know what they did with the cgi which it seemed like was really good in this show but specifically in that scene where the mom has to sacrifice herself because it's a car chase scene the car ends up being uh crashes into something and then the mom has to end up uh, screaming so that Percy Jackson and Grover can make it to Camp Half-Blood and kind
kind of distract the Minotaur, and then the Minotaur picks the mom up, and suddenly she kind of vanishes into thin air. So is this like platform nine and three quarters, where like all the kids that go there have to form or like beat some giant monster to get in, or is it... No. Or is this one specifically going after Percy because he's so connected with such a big guy? I think what happened in the book, and I'm pretty sure this is what happened in the TV show, is once Percy first uses powers to push the girl into the river, yes. and again, he didn't even mean to do it, that kind of awoken all the evil people's senses, hence the reason why Miss Dodge was like, oh, this must be per uh, Poseidon's son, and then decided to drag him in. And so therefore, like the Minotaur, they're all trying to get to Percy Jackson because once he uses his powers, it's like he's been uh, reborn almost. Do we know who they work for, though, or are they just all doing this independently? I think they're all doing it independently. All right. So, so when they get to Camp Half-Blood, that's really where the second episode takes place. Camp Half-Blood. Now, now, because those are all supposed to be like half god because one of their parents is right yes because of the, that's the name of half bloods and i remember half bloods in the harry potter series are always like made fun of mm -hmm. but like is there a camp full blood <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 it's only camp half -blood. is that because like the gods themselves have a school in the sky that they all go to and the only ones that would be on earth are half bloods i think so yeah yeah because luke he's like the uh, i think he's the son of hermes yeah or, and then uh or, also, yeah and also you have people like Annabeth, I think that she, I forgot who she's the son of. but it, The daughter, you mean? Yeah, the daughter of. Okay, but yeah, no, I know that information somewhere on my list, but I'm not going to go looking like for it. Like, they even take Percy and, and they, they throw him just into a random camp, but by the end of the second episode, they learn, because once he gets to water, that he's the son of Poseidon, so he's put into Poseidon's camp. So these are all characters from the that, that he meets there, but Annabeth is less of a Hermione in that she's not entering the school at the same time that Percy is. Yes. she's been there for quite some time right the moat like she and luke have been there the longest in fact luke is sort of not um a straight up like antagonist to percy but he's more like a, a like they both are vying for annabeth's attention does that happen it, no, that, that's not what we saw in the second episode. No, we just see Lucas being incredibly nice to Percy because we see Percy also have to deal with bullies and, and kind of their henchmen. Like I meant more bullies. like, is he jealous of Luke at all for like his being good at stuff? Not from what we've seen so far because they've only done the capture the flag sequence and the capture the flag sequence took place at the second half of the, uh, of the episode. So he gets to this camp and then they're like, all right, school activity. This is going to be fun time. It well, sounds first, like first he's trying to figure out who his father because he doesn't know what Camp Half-Blood is at all. So he goes into this random house where Jason Manzoukas had no idea he was going to be in this show. It seems like he's still on his conquest to try and be in every single TV show ever made. There's that, <laughs> and he's also, like, a huge YA fan. He's a huge Harry Potter fan. Like, he even uh, yeah, don't fight I kids do about that. that. But, like, uh, <laughs> not literally. But Paper Girls, he was in that series. He played the bad guy. I think he just likes being either very crass and crude with the League-type roles, but then he also likes to jump in and do this he kid stuff. He always does but take his Rafi role into everything even as the energy he brings into it if he hadn't have done the league i read somewhere that he was planning on retiring and that just would have been a shame for everybody <laughs> but mr yeah mr dionysus or mr d as they call them dionysus dionysus i don't know it's always hard for me dionysus, to pronounce their, okay, yeah, yeah. To pronounce their names but well, i say reardon and i th hear people say riordan so I, I don't know either so he he even tries to convince percy that uh that he's his father at very first when percy no. is trying to figure okay. out his father yeah, is. That. But, but that's because the main joke and the on running joke with his character it's even done in the films is that he's not able to drink any wine like no matter what i think Zeus has put a curse on him where it's like oh, whatever he tries to do about percy for a second no right, no, yeah, no, yeah. no dionysus and then dionysus. that's where we figure out that mr bruner is chiron he's a centaur chiron uh, yeah, yeah chiron and and i think that mr bruner was probably my second favorite character if i had to pick people because he's the dumbledore he's uh dr senator doctor from or doctor <laughs> sorry <laughs> dr uh senator from uh, Fargo season four. I think we talked about him back then. He's also been in The Wire. He's been a, in a bunch of stuff. You did gloss over the fact when Percy gets uh, kicked out of his own school for the sixth time, you said? Yeah. Um, that the headmaster there, he's the guy from Upload. He's been in iZombie, Hero, Kanaga. But the person sitting on the left was Rick Reardon. He made oh, an appearance. Oh, I didn't even... The, I, yeah, remember I didn't there were two know. guys and he was the one on the left. That, and, yeah, mm -hmm. and people aren't sure if he's going to keep on showing up like Stan Lee or if he's
he's going to just, if that was a one time off. I think that the second best thing about the show is that you could watch this and enjoy it, understand it, and like it. It's not so just for, eggs, it's not though. just for a younger audience. It, it was made with care, not kid gloves. Really? Like, okay. Yeah. As an audience member, this is, I, this is made, I think almost more for the people that grew up with Percy Jackson. Like you said, 2005 was what, 18 years ago. So people that were reading the books back in elementary school or middle school probably have kids now that they can enjoy this with and i don't think that it ever gets to the point yes percy jackson does floss at the end of the second episode yes, he does. there are a couple lines said here and there by the kids but you're not it's not ever to the point where it just seems like it's too much well i'm glad to hear you say that because some of the criticism it's received is that it may be too skewed too tailored toward the younger audience and so hearing someone a fan from the early editions um saying that it, that it's still good is that's that's good for anybody who wants to check it out. i have a problem with people saying that about because the the book was made for that younger audience Absolutely. That they're doing it but too. you were just saying that adults will find stuff to yes. enjoy about it too it does have the benefit of positive promotional marketing it feels like this thing for the last year because reardon has been the one at the helm and that like that there's just been a lot of positivity surrounding this entire series and the actually movies, when we did yeah. i was this the person who directed the second film i forgot what his last name was but the first name was thor it was quantum leap that we did the pilot for and about a year ago when i figured out that that was the same person i just decided to read the first two books for fun. So mm -hmm. when I learned that this was coming out about a year ago, I was really happy that I did that. Well, this eight episode series is only supposed to cover the first book. So does it do a good job? Are you a fourth of the way through the book by the end of the second episode? And I realize we haven't even talked too much about the second episode yet. Besides yeah, I mean, I, I would say that actually, I think that you're even less or so. And that's getting into my cons, even though it's taking its time. And I like that they end the first episode with him finally gaining the camp half blood. It seems like the second episode episode slammed on the brakes because we as stated before or it just eased them on it sounds I, like it's it's hard because it's like annabeth for example who the movie i think introduces 25 minutes of the way through yes. here we're not really introduced to her until the latter half of the second episode she's one of the main characters one of the three percy jackson grover and annabeth well is she introduced early on in the book as well I, th I think so. That's what I'm asking. It's like, does it follow as far as a fourth of the way through the story of the book? Like, where would that put you novel chapter wise? I'm not expecting you to be mm, an encyclopedia. Maybe like, like, maybe like five or six. Okay. I, I would think. I think the book's around 400 pages. Yeah. And he already was in Camp Half-Blood by then? Yeah. And the Capture of the Flag sequence is straight from the book. I like how verbatim almost it was too. It, it, it's like the words were painted on the screen. But my problem is that it does take such slow pacing. It's for us to even get we're not on the adventure yet it so seems no like issue by with the pacing episode one issues with the pacing episode two get past the capture the flag thing and talk to me about what the rest of the episode's about that is what the rest of that's the, the entire episode is. yes because it that's leads up at. to capture the flag and uh and percy ends up uh kind of taking on the clarice who was one of the bullies, the bullies yeah yeah and uh and they're about to like throw his head in the toilet and he he ends up making the toilet explode given that he's in his seventh place now with kids of trouble troubled youth you would think that he would be used to being bullied or being the bully of such i right? think this was supposed to show that the bullies here are so much more powerful because they like him are demigods okay you know but they end up figuring out that he's the son of poseidon when he's thrown into the ocean because oh, it, even it would have been funnier if it had been the toilet because like the toilet's <laughs> connection to the sewer pipes connected to the ocean suddenly poseidon comes out of the toilet i'm not <laughs> sure if it was really meant to supposed to be that much of a twist though i think it was like you were supposed to know it as the audience and member. Poseidon doesn't actually show up right not yet yes but his his uh, what what is it called his trident his does. trident does but the trident coming out of the toilet that would have been <laughs> no, a crazy no, no, no. scene he's in, he's in the river <laughs> I know I know and then and then the trident is it's not it's not even the trident that shows up it's just the symbol I think in water form is like above him so that's how they know still thinking so, about it in the bathroom <laughs> it was Poseidon, Poseidon has claimed him uh, but uh, in terms wait, of, what does that even mean? So you're like the kid of the person. <laughs> you're already their kid, though. That's how Chiron says it. He says, and Poseidon you're telling me that Percy you. hasn't, in all his years up until now, I know he's only 12 years old, but that he hasn't found his way into an ocean. No. So had he done that when he was like no, six no, no. years old? Again, I you think have to be second. I, I think you have to unlock your powers for first before that ends up happening. Uh, all right. You. So there's a lot of different stipulations that have to get. Uh, also, they're in Camp Half Blood. I don't think it's just 
every single time he goes into the water. This is a special place that regular humans can't just stumble into. And that's actually an important point, because when Miss Dodds turns into the creature in the middle of New York City, it's much like Harry Potter with, like, muggle proof, where it's like no one else could see see her do that. It was only because Percy Jackson is a demigod that that ended up happening. All right, so what happens after all this? So that's when it, Chiron and Mr. D take Percy in and they're like, look, Zeus Master Bolt uh, is stolen because Zeus and Poseidon are having a war. They think that you have taken it. And then Percy's like, but I haven't taken it. And they're like, well, we know that Hades probably has it. But since Zeus thinks that you have it, since I'm sorry, you're the son of Poseidon. I don't need to be so nitpicky, but like, let me understand this. He's just been claimed. So that means that he's just unlocked his powers, yes. right? So how could the gods think that he just stole one of the most powerful weapons of all time? I think he's always been Poseidon's son. So yes, they think- but like if you haven't been claimed, it's clear that you haven't even been like you wouldn't know it. Like, if he if he knew anything about these things, then he would have already been claimed. Well, I think what happened was Zeus thinks that Poseidon stole the, the Thunderbolt or the Master Bolt, which okay. is, again, Zeus's prized possession. And then maybe Poseidon gave it to Percy Jackson just to keep. But, hmm. the, but what, what happens is, is they're like, we know that Hades probably has it. So Grover ends up coming in and he's like, you know what? I'm going to try and save it because I don't think that your mom is dead. He learns midway through the second episode, unlike the mom just dying, she ended up, uh, like I said, kind of uh, turned into uh, particles. I mean, no one's ever dead when the god universe. Yeah, turned yeah. into particles and therefore they're like, Hades probably has your mom. So I'm going to go with you. And uh, again, I just, I have such a problem with, that we get so little Annabeth and I even wasn't that big a fan of Grover's character up until this point because we see so I little I asked you what you him. thought of him and you said that he was fine that he was like sort of like he was in the books and I, I don't want to say I don't want to say that I didn't like Grover's character you don't want to go after the kids yes but, <laughs> also, right. but also because I know that they're probably going to have so much more we even see in the promo that they started their quest and we're going to see Medusa probably in the next episode mm-hmm. much like it, much like the first you definitely will see. see more famous people one of which I'll, I'll ruin because it's not that it's Lance Reddick. Yeah, no, I already knew that. So he's going to be in right the, out of John Wick Four. I was like, oh, he's going to be in the new. It's Percy not Jackson. his last TV show though, because he will be also in a voice in Kite Man, the series. Remember when we did the Harley Quinn thing and we found <laughs> yeah. out that Kite Man is getting his own spinoff? Well, he's going to be in that. So that's that's cool to hear. Um, do you think that you would recommend it to anybody who was a fan back in the day? Yes, yes, absolutely. I would give the first episode an eight, and probably the second episode. It does pass. It, it looks good and i think that it once we actually get on the road i'm excited to see the hotel scene because i think that land manuel miranda is going to show up he's in the trailer so i don't consider it oh, that okay. much. okay all right i don't consider it that much that no, but yeah spoiler but it, i think that they're going to probably be good once we just kind of get through the starting point it's almost like how some people felt with the hobbit the first movie it was like once we got through that I, I feel like the rest of the story is going to be good. I'm going to give the overall show a 7 out of 10. Yeah, and I already said the positive benefits going into it was the promotion, but there's also the fact that it's been 13 years since the movie, and so even though that doesn't feel like a ton of time, it's still enough where I think you can see that the movie's not going to get better with age, <laughs> unlike with The Room or Mac and Me, where you're going to get that cult audience. It's or even... so, it was weird to see Rosario Dawson, though, uh, like so young, because she plays, I think, Aphrodite or whoever hates girlfriend is in the movies yeah okay all right yeah i thought you were saying they de-aged her for this or something but yeah and then andrew garfield's spider-man like a when they rebooted that after a couple years people got really upset so yeah it's been 13 years so it's a good amount of time they also had the deal in 2019 of fox buying disney and this part i did or sorry disney buying fox and this is the part i didn't realize in politically um rick reardon he was waiting on that deal to happen because Fox had the rights to his books, making them into movies and Mm. Disney had the publishing rights. So this kind of presented an opportunity for him to really like claim back the series that he had lost any control over. And the interesting thing about it, besides just uh, creating it, pitching it, producing it, he's doing it with his wife. You also have like big talent when it comes to the director, James Bobbin co-creator did he do all episodes yeah of the first two he, oh, okay. he only did the first two but he co-created flight of the concords he also did the muppet movie when that came out and <laughs> its sequel um and also allison looking through the looking glass and the mysterious benedict uh, society the the episodes the i watched? first episode yes yeah wow okay yeah because it's uh, I, this feels very mystical 
almost well, like that. The I was going to make Benedict a ton of comparisons, did. but the Benedict Society is geared toward those kids again. You also have sort of a good omens feel, maybe because yes. of the Greek gods. Get get to your comparisons though, because I have them as That's well. That's what I'm doing. Harry um, Potter. You've got again similar ages, schools, friend sets, prophecies, uh, all that jazz. And then the one that I wouldn't have expected, because you also also have Avatar coming out pretty, or yeah, Avatar, Avatar the Blast series Urban, coming yeah, out, yeah. come pr pretty soon. And then you have his Dark Materials, which came out as a TV show. But the story that surprisingly compares to it the most to me, despite the ages of the characters, I think being I know it. Yeah. Is Aragon. Oh, Aragon. So, so the the deal with Aragon was it was also a terrible movie in the 2000s, right? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's like a 16 percent, even worse than the two percent. Let's play films. a little game. So Rick Reardon and uh, Christopher um, Polini, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. They both have said things vocally about the movies and about their books and stuff like that. And I want to see if you can tell which is attributed to which author, because oh, I okay. think they have a certain parallelism. All right. Yeah. This is the first quote. The movie reflects the studio and the director's view of the story, whereas the books reflect mine, and everyone is free to enjoy them on their own merits. That has to be Rick Reardon, right? No, that was actually... What? Yeah, that was Christopher Poloni. That was the Aragon series, all right? If I were intentionally trying to sabotage the project, I doubt I could have done a better job than this script. Hmm. I'm going to say Rick Reardon because I think he even was on record saying to the studio, just do whatever you want. Like once he gave them the, the, the rights. He did not say that. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. I mean, he said the quote. He did never said the thing about just do whatever well, I, you want. He was writing them emails. He's even put those emails out explicitly on, stating. I <laughs> no, it's really cool. It's on his website. You can, but yes, that is a Rick Reardon uh, quote. The next one is check my website. And then I'm not oh, going to tell you the website. Well, they both have websites. Oh, okay, go so ahead. So check my website. Do you see any indication there uh, that the movies uh, were movies slash movies were ever created? No, no, you do not. Rick, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm gonna go with the other guy, Chris. Aragon. His name, guy? yeah, Aragon. Nope, it's actually Rick Reardon, like you were saying. Last one. It was the money. Sorry, it, it was their money, so they were the ones in charge. If another adaptation ever gets off the ground, though, you can rest assured I'll retain as much control as possible. Again, these are quotes from like the mid 2015, like 2015 to 2018. -ish. I'm going to guess Rick Reardon. Nope, that's actually <laughs> the Aragon I, I one. I got like almost all of them wrong. And the Aragon <laughs> one, they had the same issue. Fox was the one in control of their rights. Disney bought up Fox. And now mm. they're making a series for Aragon as well. And some of the producers are doing that one. And so like there's and the books are now coming out in his series like he started the inheritance cycle again just as rick reardon started the percy jackson cycle. yeah i was again. so surprised to see that a new book came out in 2023 and there's another one coming out in 2024 um so so yeah it, the, these two series are like neck and neck they're just together and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the guys are friends i think one of the reasons also that the second uh film failed and why i'm a little afraid because i do hope that this gets another season just from what i've seen is that sea of monsters and i don't know if this is how everyone feels but i talked to a lot of people that read the book in elementary school and i think everyone agrees including me that sea of monsters is the weakest of all the books huh, that's like when game of thrones was getting near the part right. where they stopped being able to adapt his novels and i think like, once it gets part once series. it gets to the titan's curse because you said every single book is a season the titan's curse i think is the third book i think we're fine but sea of monsters is, it feels like that's going to be kind of hard to get through yeah G game of thrones is another reason why i don't feel like as much towards christopher columbus like in a bad way because they aged up the characters that there for the same exact reason right. Right. Well, not the same exact because less about the sex, more about the action <laughs> stuff, right? Like they didn't want Jon Snow to have to do like crazy stunts when he's like 12 years old. Or the whatever. comparisons I had were the Maze Runner series, the Hunger Games, Ender's Game, Stranger Things, The 100, Umbrella Academy, Lost in Space. And then when we're getting into books, Ready Player One. And surprisingly, just kind of with the Camp Half-Blood thing, even though Camp Half-Blood was way better than this was Red Rising. Oh, that makes the no, Red Rising. I just can't wait to see how they portray that later on, Darrow and, and his inner thoughts. The inner thoughts are always so hard to depict on a, a tv screen right they have to like change that entire like how they do the psyche of of uh and so walter scoville's gotten a lot of credit for that the kids have i think he deserves it i think percy jackson yeah he does a great job as percy jackson the reception has been favorable 73 on metacritic andy wire and entertainment give it a b plus uh seven out of ten on ign ron tomatoes has a 96 percent critic score 
61% audience score. Um, Percy Jackson and the Olympians isn't a Greek tragedy, but it isn't a God tier Disney Plus show either. That was the most negative of the reviews that I saw. That was on Tech Radar. Um, the criticism, uh, if if there is a few besides being targeted towards a younger audience is that the world building and production design are pretty unmemorable mm. to some people. And then also that the night vision battles, the shoddy CGI in places and that there were pacing issues. Um, th that was the extent of it. I think yeah. that I'm not saying you're saying it's a great show, but this once again goes back to like the one piece Ichiro Oda or as you're as here, Rick Reardon with Percy Jackson, where it's just make the creator who made the actual thing, That's, yeah. make them have something to do with the show. Because I think that, yeah, this is way better than the movies were. I was a little surprised to see that the budget was 12 to $15 million an episode. That feels very much like Marvel. That's almost it feels like, like $100 million for the whole show. Well, when people talk about criticisms with the night vision battles, like it, it the Minotaur scene was supposed to be really cool, but it was at night. And then shoddy CGI other places. Um, but you said the CGI was pretty good. Maybe so maybe when uh, Chiron or is it Chiron, Chiron yeah. when he when he walks in, I did think that that looked a little odd as as a centaur. But except for that, I can't really think of anything else. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye. Bye.